Hello, everybody. This is Amy. I am the VP of Conservation at Oakland Zoo. You're watching Cocktails and Conservation. What a joy it is to share the world with wildlife. It is also a challenge. Today, we're going to dig deep into one of the most fascinating, mythical, and misunderstood animals on the planet, bats. They are so freaking cool. But did you know that out of the 1,300 species, half of them are endangered? We have a lot to learn. Let's find out everything with one of the world leading bat people today. I'm so glad you're here with us at Cocktails and Conservation. You're watching Cocktails and Conservation, where we rendezvous with inspiring wildlife conservation leaders from around the planet, hear their stories, learn how they protect the animals we love, and how each of us can help them. With our featured custom cocktail, together we toast to Taking Action for Wildlife. Hi everybody, you are watching cocktails and conservation where we meet with wildlife heroes from around the world we hear their stories we join their solutions we have a refreshing beverage with people like you people who like to have fun but really do want to connect take action for wildlife and be part of a better world i am your host i am amy gottliff i am the vp of conservation at oakland zoo um oakland zoo it is centered to our mission to conserve wildlife and also to give a voice to these fantastic people that we get to partner with around the world. When it is not that safe to do that right now due to the current circumstances. So Cocktail Sense Conservation is our way to gather, get together safely, raise awareness, support our local conservation partners, Build our community of people, again, like you, who want to have fun and take action for wildlife, and also help local restaurants, help local bars, get the word out about the great things that they do. So today we are going to just pretend we're together. Um, let's say we're at a rainforest lodge um, on some island, um, looking up at the sky darkening, and we're seeing bats and we're learning all about them from a bat expert who just kind of happens to be at the lodge with us. Does that sound good? If that sounds good, why don't you just put like a flap in the messages? Am I seeing some flaps? All right, while you're flapping, um, let's talk about myths. All right, there's a lot of information going on out there about a lot of things, but around bats, people have some pretty funny ideas about what is true and not true. There's a lot of myths about bats, and we're going to myth bust today. So why don't you type in something that you've heard that you think you believe, but not quite, and maybe we'll get around to figuring out if that's true or not. So type your myths in there. What is a bat myth that you kind of believe? All right, while you're doing that, I want to welcome you all. It's so good to see people here that I know. Um, and we want to welcome anyone who's watching from Facebook, anyone from the zoo community who's joining us, staff, docents, interns, um, our donors, friends of the wild. Thank you so much. Can't do any of this without you. Um, anybody from Luby Bat Conservancy who's maybe out there? Um, any bat people whatsoever? Um, maybe some friends from Daughter Thai, um, the great restaurant that we're going to be partnering with today. Um, we're really glad you're here and we're going to be talking with someone I'm so glad to partner with and that is Brian Pope. He is the director of Luby Bat Conservancy in Florida. And I want to say that Brian is amazing. Um, he has done so much for Luby. He's so enthusiastic. Not only does he care for bats, which he's done for a very long time at different facilities, even at Disney, started out caring for the bats at this conservancy and just worked his way up to director just because he's so passionate and you can really see that and I'm excited to share that with you. So now would be a time for me to say, hello, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> There you are. Hello, thank you for having me. 
Yeah, it's so great to have you. Um, I've already complimented you on your beautiful background that already just shows your passion for bats. Um, uh, not typical. Um, like I said, we took some of these from work, but um, we figured it was between some instruments we have at the house or some paintings that have nothing to do with bats. But we do have some beautiful paintings kind of here and there uh, that a local artist did for us. And it uh, they literally took pictures of some of the bats that are in Luby and he made them into paintings and we just love them. And we have them. This way, this guy right here, we have a stuffed animal, this black bat. Um, he kind of reminds us of one of the bats that we have at Luby. His name's Nagara. And he's just this big hulking bat. He doesn't really have much of a neck, um, but he has been a father about 10 times over. And every we like using him, uh, using a stuffed animal whenever we uh, we talk about bats, because it kind of reminds us of one of the ones we have there. So, yes, we have this beautiful background of some of the bat paintings. And these are paintings and some of the things we have here at our home, but also at Luby as well. I think anybody in wildlife conservation has stuffed animals and puppets. We just <laughs> can't help ourselves. We have them or someone sent them to us or we secretly have a stash of them. But they're useful when you're talking about the animal. That's for sure. Yes. I mean, it helps us. I mean, we have a lot of bat things uh, at the house and obviously at Luby. But though we wanted to try to have a, a background that would uh, just really exemplify what Luby does and what we're talking about today. I love it. And um, you're, you know, we're here in Oakland, but it's so good to talk to you way over there in Florida. Um, and how, how, I hope, how are you staying sane over there? This is a rough time of year in Florida because the weather is very steamy. <laughs> it's very hot. And uh, also, um, obviously, it's, uh, we have our hurricane season wrapping up. We have a storm we're actually watching right now. So we have to watch these and track them carefully um, because if it gets strong, we have to move the bats because they're in outdoor enclosures. And if we get really sustained winds, the bats are going to be hanging like that and they're going to let us know about it the next day. So um, it's a little hot and steamy here in Florida, but I love this state. I've been here in, in Florida for about 24 years now. The bats are doing well. They're tropical bats. And like I said, they have outdoor enclosures and they are thoroughly enjoying this weather. And on top of it, um, their breeding season is linked to photo period. And it's pretty neat that right around mid-August, we see we see and hear all these different breeding behaviors. So things are starting to get loud at Luby uh, as the males are starting their breeding and territorial vocalizations. And so it's, uh, it's starting to be very active at Luby with the animals, all because of the shutdown, things have been uh, quiet, at least for the staff and our normal operations. So hot and steamy all around over there. <laughs> Yeesh. <laughs> Okay, before we go any further, I just want to say a thank you to everyone out there who has supported the zoo, um, which is open now and so wonderful to stroll about. Um, the support has been amazing for us, still needed, um, but this hour is all about Brian. It's all this way. It's all about Luby um, and the bats and the conservation he's doing. So any love you're feeling for us, Thank you. And we're going to pour it all into Brian and his mm -hmm. project today. And I also want to thank those who've come to all these episodes. This is the fourth one we're doing. And, we've, you oh, know, they've nice. had bump ups and donations and all kinds of other ways to help. And we appreciate that. That's the conservation community we're going for. So today is our time to love, love the bat project. Mm -hmm. All right. So um, the issue that we're exploring, of course, I'm the conservation director. So that is um, or the VP of conservation. And that's what's on my mind. And bats are an endangered species that people really don't seem to know how endangered they are. Um, and they don't seem to get the attention that they need compared to other endangered species. They've been persecuted. They've been poached. Um, they've been kind of killed out of fear and misunderstanding. Um, they're also being blamed for things right now. Um, but we know they're awesome and important, and we're so excited to talk to you about that today. No, I'm, I'm happy to talk to you. And you mentioned about some of the threats that bats are facing. I mean, there are um, about 1,400 species, and uh, about a quarter of those are threatened with extinction. What's surprising here, here in the United States, we have about 47 species, and 40% of those uh, are, are threatened with extinction. So, I mean, they're facing a multitude of, um, of issues right now, everything from persecution to overhunting to deforestation. Uh, right here in North America, we're dealing with white-nose syndrome. Um, but uh, yeah, because of the current situation and pandemic, uh, they're getting falsely blamed um, for some of the issues right now. And there are some pretty terrible stories out there right now about what's happened to bat colonies in certain countries. And it's out of fear and persecution. So um, I 
really appreciate this platform to, to not only talk about bats, but talk about Lily and talk about conservation in general, uh, because these bats need it. And they don't really get the attention that a lot of the charismatics get, like tigers and rhinos and elephants. And I'm not saying that these species don't, uh, don't also uh, face a lot of issues, uh, but bats just don't really get a lot of love that I feel they, they, they should get, um, and it's due to them, uh, because there's no other mammal out there that really does the it performs the ecosystem services that these animals do on a daily basis. Um, and I'm not saying anything bad about pandas, but you know, <laughs> every <laughs> night bats are out there eating mosquitoes, eating agricultural pests, um, pollinating flowers, dispersing seeds. And there's really no other mammal on the planet that, that performs the ecosystem services that bats do. So definitely appreciate the opportunity to talk about them. Yay. Well, before you go any further, um, my mistake for not telling everybody, if you're ready to start having that cocktail, um, which is called mm -hmm. Flying Fox <laughs> in Paradise, we will see the video of how to, but the recipe, if you want to get that going, is going to be in the chats. It may already be there. They may be ahead of me, um, but it's delish. All right. It's a little smoky. It's a pretty good drink. We, we may have tried just a little bit, ju just I to make sure it's on the yeah. We yeah. have. We're not saying we did. <laughs> All right. I can see this really. I love this picture. Um, it really shows your joy of working with this species. Um, you take care of bats and I can see how much you care about that. So I guess I'll start with you, Brian. Um, what brought you to love bats? Um, well, a long time ago, <laughs> over 20 years ago, I was working at the Pittsburgh Zoo and, and I loved what I was doing, but um, but honestly, I wanted to expand my horizons and um, I had applied at four different places and, and moving south was definitely a big bonus. I, I don't really like cold weather and I had um, found out about uh, Louis Bat Conservancy and I've always been fascinated by bats and I grew up in uh, southwestern Pennsylvania um, in, uh, in a very country area and we would always see bats around and just there really wasn't a lot of information out there There was these little things that were flying at night and you could see them in some of the street lights um, But what I really liked that Luby was doing was was they were involved in a lot of conservation work And that's a direction that I really wanted to take my career. So back in 1996 um, I had applied and got the job. So uh, I worked with them at Luby for two years and and people always ask me, what is it about bats? Why do you love working with them? And I think just because they're so different, they're so unusual. I mean, they're the only mammals that fly. And to truly appreciate how evolutionarily sophisticated they are, you have a mammal that flies, that echolocates. Now, not these ones that was in that picture. Uh, those are the big old world fruit bats and this guy too. They don't echolocate. It's not about the 1,400 species. 200 of them don't echolocate. But let's just focus on the bats that echolocate. You have a mammal that flies, that echolocates at the same time while it's hunting, while it's navigating, while it's talking to its friends. And there's just something that's completely amazing about these animals. So uh, I worked with them for two years and then I went to Disney's Animal Kingdom for about 10. Um, and I enjoyed, thoroughly enjoyed my time there. But I had an opportunity to come back to Luby as curator in 2007. And after um, talking with my wife and my family and all the folks at Disney, they said, you gotta take it. And then in 2011, we became director and I, love what I do. I, I very much love my career and uh, and I love the organization I work for. I, I feel I know we're making a difference and that's what I truly appreciate about my job. All right. I love it. And I love that Oakland Zoo gets to partner with you. So we, if you don't know, um, we have a colony of bats that we got from Luby, a bunch of boys, and we just honor and adore them. And they are such people are amazed by these. So we have a partnership with Luby and so excited that we have that and we get to support the work of the conservation you're doing in the field. So yeah, you guys have been with us for 15 years and we truly appreciate the support you guys have given us for years on top of that too. I mean, you guys have been great supporters of Luby. All right, here's a myth for you from Joyce Hicks. They will suck your blood and give you rabies. Absolutely a myth. So of the 1,421 species of bats, Today, and I should mention, when I started working with them 24 years ago, there was only 920 known species. So you're looking at almost 500 species here in just a couple of decades. There are only three that are vampire bats and they're found in Central and South America and they do feed on blood. Um, but again, three bats out of 1400 plus species. They give you rabies. Uh, it's actually the numbers are less than one tenth of 1% have rabies. So there's a lot more uh, skunks and foxes and rabid dogs uh, that cause rabies. But bats, like any mammal can get rabies. So can we, so can bats, so can your dogs, but they don't just have it. And that's the main thing. They can get it, but they don't just have it. 
Got it. All right. Um, here's a photo that, <laughs> I mean, there's a couple of them. Let's start with this one. I mean, just the, <laughs> what's happening here, just the relationship between this mom and baby is, I can't handle how cute that is. That's a bad so conservation. This, I can't help it. The small one is tasting the big one because it's about ready to eat it. Uh, <laughs> come on, it's going in the mess. So, <laughs> so this, is taken, this is taken a few years ago. Um, and this is actually a, a mother and a pup. And um, one of the things that we like to talk about is, you know, bats are mammals. They're just like us. Uh, they give birth to live young. They have fur. They nurse their babies. And we had actually had a photographer in um, Tulubi a couple of years ago. And this is uh, Bufa is the mother. And then her uh, pup is Beulah. And uh, that was Beulah just licking her mom. And actually, if we want to get scientific about what that probably was. Um, so the babies will nurse off of the mothers. And the teats aren't in the front. They're actually to the side. Perfect. Good timing. Um, this is a really good shot. So here, I keep getting it wrong. Yeah. Anyway, it's, it's yeah, <laughs> over here. But actually, it's a great shot of, of the, the um, pup nursing off the mom. And in the previous picture, whenever she had the tongue, so they'll nurse and they'll get milk for a while, but then they start to get it, they'll start eating fruits and juices from the mother's face. So <clears throat> maybe she was just loving her mother down. Um, but there was a good chance she may have been licking some fruit juice off the mom. But I absolutely love uh, that picture of the mom or the pup licking the, the baby pup licking the mother, but this picture that you have up here, um, it's just a good shot that's showing how these uh, the babies nurse off the mother. And obviously mom doesn't seem to care because she has a mouthful of banana right now. Uh, but it's just a good shot to show you they're mammals just like us. They nurse off of their mothers just like humans, just like other mammals. And uh, I appreciate you putting that picture up because it's pretty good shot. I mean, it's with what they're like underneath the wings. Yes, yes. So, I mean, I'm glad you brought that up. So what makes a bat unique is that their ability to fly. They have 10 fingers and 10 toes, just like us. Their upper arm is in proportion to the rest of their body, but it's their forearm and their finger bones, which are very, very long. Um, so it, what that arm is just encased in skin, but that's what enables them to fly. And that's a very good shot of the baby's tucked into the mom, tucked into the armpit area. And what the mother will do is she'll wrap that baby up and keep her warm. And here's something, some more trivia facts for you here. Whenever a baby bat is born, it is about 10 to 20% of the mom's body weight. So you crunch the numbers on that. These are very, very large uh, babies whenever they're born. Their feet are about 85% of the adult ones. So you have these huge feet so they can hold on to their mothers while they're nursing because they have these their, their back uh, teeth, their, their milk teeth kind of hook into the mom's teeth. A little rough for mom for a while, but that's how, I should show you how strong and powerful the mothers are, is that they can fly with these babies attached to them, which are 10 to 20% of their body weight, with these huge feet and these hooks that are holding on while they're nursing. So incredible animals. That goes back to your question earlier. Why do I love them? Because they're just so unique and they're so different in the mammal world. It's, 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 it's too cool. I've never seen a photo like that before of the nursing. That's amazing. So I want to talk about conservation um, and a couple of the issues before we have a drink. But I'm going to go ahead and bring up the COVID-19 situation. Um, and we're going to go ahead and put a link in the chat to the link you sent me at the zoo um, all about Luby's um, trying to explain things. But if the question were how are bats connected to COVID-19, what would be your quick and dirty answer? We don't know. We just don't. Uh, they have found, they think, an ancestral virus in one species. And I say this because we work with the agencies who are doing the research, Eco Health Alliance, NIH, NIA, Dr. Fauci, CDC. And I have spoken to my colleagues. We've worked with them in the past. And they think that they have found an ancestral virus, maybe. It's called RATG13 in the intermediate horseshoe bat. One bat out of over 1,400 species. They haven't found this in any other one. That virus is not responsible for SARS-CoV-2, which is a virus that leads to COVID-19. They think that maybe 50 to 70 years ago, this got into some kind of intermediate host. That host twisted it, and then it got it was uh, able to be transmitted to humans. Bats do not spread SARS-CoV-2. They do not cause COVID-19. And what the ancestral virus is, we don't know. We do know that bats are no more susceptible to carry coronaviruses than any other mammal. We have coronaviruses. Primates have coronaviruses. Dolphins have coronaviruses. We all have them. Whether a bat caused it, we do not know. The closest it is, is that RATG13, which is 96.3% similar to SARS-CoV-2, our genetics are 98% similar to chimps. 
We don't know. <laughs> yeah, not to mention, just go, don't eat it. Just don't eat it. That's the problem right now. And again, the, the wet markets are the problem, by the way. Wet markets are the equivalent to our farmer's markets. It's these wildlife markets that are the problem. Whenever you have civets and gemets on top of dogs and chickens and snakes and bats and primates, these animals are already stressed. And what happens to an animal when they're stressed? They're immunocompromised. They're going to shed viruses. We need to, and this, but, but how do you stop that though? And these cultures have been having these wildlife markets for centuries. We've got to stop chopping down the forests. We've got to respect our wildlife. We have to learn to leave wildlife alone. And the main thing is we have to learn to live on this earth sustainably with nature and with wildlife. I agree. I just Bats love. are not the problem. Thank you. I love this mess. I think we're all. I think we're all on the same page. My this group of ninety-seven. Um, I love that Carol Moen Wing says bats have given me some of my most unique and special wild animal sightings. Oh. I love them, and they need our advocacy and support. They're incredible animals. That's right. Thank you, Carol. Okay, so here's one of the issue photos that I hate to show, but what is happening in this photo? So this was a photo that was taken over in the Commonwealth of the Northern Marianas Islands, excuse me, by Guam, and this is honey. Um, and you and I are in the conservation fields and we do know that um, the hunters we work with are also part of the conservation solution, but it's the poachers that are, at the, that are the problem. This particular picture was taken from a maternity colony. And if you look closely in that picture, there's a pup that's attached to that mom. So the problem is um, whenever hunting isn't regulated, whenever it's over hunting, whenever it's the poachers uh, who are taking these bats and selling them in these wildlife markets, that is the problem. There is going to be hunting. It's just part of the cultures. Hunting's big in our culture. I mean, it's just it's just the way that it is. Um, but whenever there's no regulations, they're hunting during maternity season. I'm just talking about bats. They're hunting during maternity season. It's over hunting. Uh, and again, it, going in, into these forests, we you know what Bushmeat is, they're just clearing these forests out, including bats. That's the problem. The hunters aren't really the problem, especially the people that, again, been doing this for centuries, part of their culture. Poachers are the problem. No regulations, overhunting, but also straight up persecution because they don't have protections in a lot of countries. Malaysia, within the past few years, finally protected the big flying foxes, the old world fruit bats there, after decades and of just not being protected, they were just looked at as a crop. Now they, or sorry, as a pest, as a crop pest. Now they actually have legal protection. So um, and there's another one right there. And actually this is probably more than anything's deforestation. This is taken from our, our colleague, Dr. Tyrone Lavery, who we work with in the Solomon Islands a lot and Oakland Zoo and the Oakland Zoo supporters have helped to fund a lot of our projects over the Solomons. This is deforestation and it's rampant deforestation. It's not just the Solomons, it's everywhere. It's in, you know, areas in the United States, Central South America, it's all over the world. The deforestation is a problem that's not only really just affecting bats, it's affecting wildlife in general. But if we're going to talk about the pictures that people have seen so far and the kind of bats that are in Oakland and the majority of the bats that are Luby, these are bats that roost in trees. They need trees to roost. No trees, no bats, no pollination, no insect control, no seed dispersal. Um, so again, it's about that, that sustainable balance. You're going to have development, you're gonna have growth. Can we do it on a sustainable level uh, that's good for humans and wildlife as well? Um, yeah. <laughs> One more issue that you and I talked about, but then Peg Carlson Bowen mentioned, uh-oh, where did she go? It's just changed. Um, well, she was asking about the, the white nose White nose syndrome, right? Um, so white nose syndrome is a disease that only affects hibernating bats. It was first discovered in a cave outside, of, in a cave in New York um, in 2006. Since then it's spread to 36 states, seven Canadian provinces, and it's a fungus that, uh, short answer, wakes bats up during hibernation. And what it does is it irritates them, it wakes them up, they deplete those essential fat reserves, then they get hungry, they get thirsty, and they found thousands of bats that are froze to death or starved to death, died of thirst outside of these caves in the wintertime. And, um, but it also, it affects their respiratory systems, it affects their immune systems. And this has been uh, one of North America's largest wildlife epidemics. So far it's killed about seven to 8 million bats and it's in these caves. And again, it's affecting bats that go into true hibernation, but it affects uh, certain bat species differently. So little brown bats 
almost a 98 to 100 percent mortality. Big brown bats about 25 to 40 percent. So here in, in Florida, white nose syndrome isn't here, but we have lots and lots of caves. And I know the good folks up at uh, Fish and Wildlife Service have been checking those caves. Um, but the main thing to know is it's it's a problem um, in North America. It is killing bats. And if people want to know what they can do, if they're going to go go into a cave where there are bats there, just follow the rules. Decontaminate before, decontaminate after. Follow the rules um, and be respectful for the wildlife that's there. But uh, yeah, just Google white nose syndrome. Uh, there's a lot of good information there, and there's a lot of good researchers who are doing work um, to try to put a stop to this. All right, I love that you're giving us hints about what each person can do to help. We're going to definitely make sure we mail that before the end of this. That's what we want to hear. I mean, this group and whoever watches this again just wants to know: Are there small or big things we can all do to help? We will get to that at the end. But right now, we're going to throw out a trivia question. Um, I already see a few people talking about it in the chat, but do you want to ask it, Brian? Because while you're thinking of the trivia, we are going to talk a little bit about our cocktail. So we like to kind of get into that, get into the animal, get into the problem, take a break with the cocktail, and then get into some hardcore solutions that the guest, Luby, is doing and what we can all do. So the trivia question. So while we are celebrating cocktails and conservations, what alcohol is very dependent upon bats for pollination? All right. And now if anybody saw the recipe, maybe they can figure it out. But there is a very important cocktail that a lot of people like that is definitely dependent on bats. Which bats. one is it? Hmm. All right. Go ahead and throw it out there in the comments if you know. Um, okay. Now is the time that I am going to say um, thank you to our guest restaurant. Um, it is a, it's a place called Daughter Thai in Montclair, Oakland. Um, very special place, very unique, um, place in Thailand that their, that they that their recipes come from. And they, you know, they agreed to be part of this. They were excited. They made up this beautiful recipe with the name Flying Fox in Paradise. Um, their bartender's name is Juan and they are open for outdoor seating. So I'm excited to learn how to make this beautiful drink Stick with us and we'll see Brian in a minute. And we are here at the Auto Thai Kitchen in Oakland. We are the only Southern Thai restaurant in Bay Area. And our bar is known for serving the fresh and tropical cocktail. With the inspiration today, I'm making you the drink called Flying Fox in Paradise. For the drink, you're going to need the Vida Mezcal, coconut rum, today I'm using the rum haven, the chili liqueur, this is the anchovia chili liqueur, the pineapple juice, and the Angostura bitter. I'm also using the simple syrup one to one ratio and the fresh squeezed lime juice. So let's get started. One ounce of the Vida Mezcal. One ounce of the coconut rum. One quarter of an ounce of the chili liqueur. And your sugar. The half an ounce of the pineapple juice. Half an ounce of the simple syrup. Three quarter of an ounce of the lime juice, and then a couple dash of the angle bitter. Now fill your shaker with the ice. Shake it up. And strain it into the cocktail glass. For the garnish, I'm using the dry pineapple slice. And a pineapple. There you go, flying cross in paradise. You see delicious cross that you can make at home. Cheers. Okay, Th this is really, really, really good. Coming <laughs> back from the kitchen. <laughs> That's, I'm getting it brought over right now. All right, here we go. Oh, nice. Perfect. Okay. Well um, this is a good time to mention that Brian's partner in crime, both at home and at Luby, is his wife. 
Did you meet at Luby or did you drag her into your world? Uh, Come on, get in the camera. Wow. She's, she was happy to be part of the lovely bad world. I can tell you. Yes. <laughs> she's okay. been, uh, we hired her five years ago because um, I needed the help. And she has gone from office administrator to programs and events coordinator to HR specialist to graphic designer to she has a lot of different roles. So yeah. I'm very glad she's here. I love she, it. Go ahead. And then I'm going to try it. Cheers. All right. Cheers. Cheers, everybody. Well, we have a little toast, and it goes like this. To taking action for wildlife, to Brian, a big hug. Let's do this <laughs> together now. Chug a look. Cheers. It's professional. It's very professional. It's very professional. Right. Um, so some of your work is right here at the center, Luby, and... You've got some great stories about some of the bats you work with. So I just want to share some of those like Curry here. Yes. What is the story with Curry? Curry. Wait, a minute. Wait I'm sorry. Okay. Did everybody get the, um, the little trivia challenge, right? I'm sure. Oh, they did. Tequila. Tequila. Bats. Thank you pollinators and thank you bats. I Absolutely. Like all right. All right. Who is Curry? Curry is a spectacled flying fox. And as far as we know, she's the only one in the Western Hemisphere. Um, to have these kind of bats in the world, I should say the flying foxes, the Taropus genus bats, you have to have special permits. So I've contacted, got my cat next to me, by the way, <laughs> coming on screen. I contacted U.S. Fish and Wildlife and I asked them, are there any other permits for this bat? And they said no. So Curry showed up on our doorstep in 2001. It was like at the end of our road. It's kind of like a quarter mile road to get into our property. And she was sitting there in a kennel with a note that says, hi, my name is Curry. Please take care of me. We don't know where she came from. She don't. We don't know how she got to Luby. I, and again, she's the only one we know of in the Western Hemisphere. But whoever had her did a heck of a job taking care of her. Oh, very, very fluffy. Um, but she's also unique. As in she, she was hand raised. We kind of think she thinks she's a person and she can't understand why she's around these other things. But Curry's been with us. We think that she's in her early 20s and these kind of bats can live 20, 30 years easy. Um, but she has had uh, she has a little bit of uh, some spinal issues, spondylosis. So she goes in. She literally went in today to the University of Florida where our vets are and she gets acupuncture and like a laser therapy and she absolutely loves it so curry is very near and dear to our heart we absolutely love this bat well that really speaks to how much you guys love bats you're taking care of the ones that need it giving them a long life giving them a forever home i love it okay this is just too much what 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 look at these faces uh so this is frick and frack and they are twins so <clears throat> twins aren't very common either with, with uh, flying foxes in the wild or, or even in, in uh, zoological facilities. So uh, these two were born two years ago. It was a first time mom. And in this species, we'd only ever had one set of twins uh, beforehand, which was the first recorded case of twins ever in this species. So she was a first time mom, um, which first time moms, so there might be a little issue, uh, a couple of issues, but we do ultrasounds and we knew that she had twins. And, um, they, they actually turned out to be great. Uh, the only concern we had was if they were male and female, I'd be able to tell them apart, but they were both male. And we're like, okay, how are we going to tell them apart? But if you can kind of tell from the pictures, Frick, who's on the left, is very auburn red color. Frack, the other way, um, is very dark. So we love these guys, Frick and Frack. They're twins. They're getting older now. They're in with some of the other adult males because uh, we do keep our sexes separated so we can control breeding. Um, but they're wonderful. They're only the, the second set of twins of the variable flying fox, which is the same species that you guys have there at Oakland Zoo um, that has ever been recorded. And since they were they were raised by their mom, but we also had, kind of had to intervene a little bit. So they're very used to uh, to us and you know they'll readily uh, check us out. And of course they want food whenever we go. Well, speaking of breeding, is that what's what's this baby? So um, he was definitely a result of breeding, <laughs> but no, no. This is this, this is Sunny. Um, Sunny was born in two thousand nine. He's a little gold metal flying fox. In the first picture that you put up there, um, that showed that uh, the red hibiscus, that's grown up Sunny. So Sunny um, was born first time mom, and he was born breech. Um, so bats are born. Uh, I should say this: old world fruit bats are born head first. But um, the other types of bats, the, the other 1,200 species, uh, for the most part, some are born breech. Okay, 
<laughs> so when a fruit bat is born, are, do they turn the other way? Do they? Ha, ha, so what they'll do, so bats are, these, these are their legs. So they're hanging upside down. Yeah. Um, the genitals are very front facing. And if it's a good birth, Baby's looking at mom and they're fully fur. So we're again, we're gonna just talk about fruit bats and flying fox. Um, so if it's a good birth, baby's head's facing mom and she'll push and sometimes she'll doze off. And but what they also do is what the way the bats go to the bathroom is they use their thumbs because again, their wings are just their hands. Yeah, so they'll hold on, they'll do their business. But if it's a if it's getting a little difficult, she'll put her feet down, she'll push, 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 and then swing back up and hold on with her legs. And then if if it's a great birth. The baby comes out. She pushes it over to that teat that's underneath the armpit, and the baby will start nursing. Like I said, they get these big feet that hold on to the mom, um, and that's how they give birth. And we actually we have a couple of cameras in our enclosures. Um, there are the Explore.org cameras, and people got to watch them give birth live uh, last year, which is great. Right. But this bat, um, Sonny, uh, he was born breech. Mother rejected him. Uh, so we had to hand raise him. So we would we would have to take him home and nurse him and everything. Long story short, he did very great. But then we had to teach him how to fly. <laughs> how are we going to do this? So the way that Luby's enclosures is set up, they're, they're octagons with a night house in the middle and the bats fly around the room. So it's like just pretend you're a catcher and the other person a few feet away from you is swinging the bat. We'd swing Sunny and let him go. And we just move further and further apart till we learn to fly. Oh my God. The only problem was that we didn't know how to teach him to land. So it was a little bit rough for a while. But uh, but Sonny is he's a character and we're wow. definitely happy to have him. All right. Speaking of characters, this is my favorite story. Mm. Yeah. I think you should share it. Whenever you work in the zoo field, you know, one of the one of the rules is you know, don't get attached to the animals, you're gonna lose them. But you know what? The reason that you do what you do and I do that everybody else in the zoological conservation field is, you know what? We love animals. And this bat, I loved. His name is Arthur. He was brought to Luby in 1990 um, with two other males and nine females. So he was in with a bat named King. Five and a half foot wingspan. Big bat, right? So King and Arthur were in a pen together, an enclosure together with uh, quite a few females. And over the years, there were a lot of Babies produce in this pen, a lot of pups. But King, this big bat, he beat on Arthur, and Arthur has these big bug eyes and these goofy snaggle teeth and everything, kind of like hanging down. But years afterwards, they did genetics and they found out that every pup that came out of there was because of Arthur. So he's a very prolific breeder. So they actually had to take King, put him in a separate pen with females, and then just you know let Arthur have his females as well because they they have harems in the wild, so that's just natural. So uh, Arthur wound up having fifty children 50 offspring 50 pups and he has over 27 grandchildren and oh some God. of those are actually at oakland uh unfortunately um arthur passed away in 2017 he's, he's a very old bat um but we are lucky to have him and what i really like is that you can tell who his offspring are because they have the snaggle teeth they have these big bug eyes and uh and typically a pretty gentle nature just like he had he was an amazing bat and anytime we have media at Luby, we would go in with them i take the media there and he just could care less that people are around so um uh, near and dear to my heart great great bat and uh he still lives on and all his children and grandchildren they're all throughout north america <laughs> I love it. So you're taking amazing care of these animals and I love that you care about their stories. They're all individuals and I'm sure that's how we feel too. Um, but you're doing conservation, um, lots of it. And some of it seems to be with native bats from Florida. So is this what's going on in this picture? So for Luby's history, we had always worked with older fruit bats for, but for the past five or six years, um, we had some a lot of parents come up and say, hey, you know, it's great that you're teaching my kids about bats in Asian Africa. Can you teach them about bats in their own backyard? So we started funding um, some field projects and then it's like, well, why aren't we doing these ourselves? So um, we uh, uh, formed a relationship with Norman Allen Associates at an environmental firm. They taught us to use uh, acoustic equipment um, to how to do wildlife surveys. Um, and that kind of eventually morphed into we were able to or had the opportunity to rescue some native bats that needed some homes. So the two on the left are evening bats. They're literally about that big. Uh, the one on the right is a southeastern myotis. Um, and we have uh, about, I'm going to get my math wrong, we have 11 native bats at Luby right now that we either that needed homes or we rescued. There was an organization that closed, we brought some in. Um, and 
what we also do at Luby is we do a lot of field work in Florida. So we just put up our 70, 75th bat house a couple Fridays ago. In two days, we're going to be out in the field doing another one. And we do acoustics all over the state. Uh, we do echolocation call analysis, which is really cool because we set these microphones up. And it listens to all these bad echolocation calls. I download the information, save, send it to a server, and I get to try to decipher all these calls. They come in these 1.7 second blocks, and you look at the shape of the call and the frequency, and you're literally listening to a world that you have no idea that's even around you. There's a good shot. That's a, a, a two by four bad house that we put up at a, at a local brewery here in Gainesville. And that was a local bat conservation, local bat field work wasn't even part of what we did just about five years ago. And it's been such a huge part of what we do. We're still very focused and concentrated on old world fruit bats. Um, but I absolutely love what we do in, in, uh, in Florida. Uh, I love that we put up bat houses and I like that it's a win, win, win. Uh, the clients are happy because they have bats around uh, controlling mosquitoes and agricultural pests. Um, the bats have a place to go and uh, Luby gets some donations out of it as well. So it's a win across the board. And I really feel that we're really giving back to the, to the local community and especially the species that are here in Florida. I love that. Um, I love that you're doing that. And Carol, Carol, again, she's on it. Um, does Brian recommend putting bat houses in our yards? Um, I was just reminded at the zoo today that we were just about to really explore bat houses at the zoo and everything went wacky doodles. Um, so we'll re we'll explore that. But do you recommend individuals put bat houses up at their houses and yeah, I mean, about the seventy, about half of the seventy-five houses we put up are on residential properties. The other half are commercial. So, if you have an open area, that's one of the main uh, main um, keys that you need. One of the main priorities is you have to have an open area. You can't put a bat house on a tree. Too much shade, too many obstacles, too many predators, snakes, and, and raptors that can get up there. So, if you have an open area, about twenty-five, or sorry, about twenty feet from your house or from a tree line, gets a lot of sun. You're by a water source. Absolutely, put up a bat house. If you have dogs that Mine's around here somewhere. She likes to, you know, a lot of dogs like to roll around and things. Maybe put a little fence around the base of the bat house, but you're going to provide a house with the bats. They're going to return the favor by eating mosquitoes. Um, if you have a farm, eating agricultural pests. And it's just kind of cool to see an emergence of a couple hundred bats or in that picture that you have, we had about 3,000 bats that came out, you know, that come out during the emergence. And it's, they're literally pouring out. And to know the ecosystem services they're doing every night, it's just, I really love this aspect of what Luby's doing. It just continues to grow every day. I love it. Um, as we roll, I want to let you guys know that Oakland Zoo will be posting a link in the chat to how to build a bat house. Um, and there also will be a link in the chat, either from Oakland Zoo or Adrian, one of our producers, um, about a Bay Area resource in case that's a little bit different. And I'm also going to ask Oakland Zoo to a little bit early jump on that donation link because as we're talking, we see that you're doing so much, Brian, and I want people to be able to have that link. They can just click it as we talk and, um, and decide they want to support all this because it's a lot. And I also love this. This seems local. Yep. Um, so <clears throat> one of the one of our main priorities at Luby, it's research, conservation, and education. And every year we talk to about 30,000 people. This year's a little bit different. Um, but I really like that we work with a lot of organizations in the community, uh, organizations that are focused on veterans, um, and organizations that, that work with children. And this particular group is called A Girl's Place. Uh, they work with young ladies. Uh, fifth or eighth grade. And what I really like about this organization is they're they're giving these these young ladies a head start. So we brought them out to Luby. They've been out a couple of times and we have the female staff work with them and talk about how they got in this position. How did you get into animal care? How did you get into conservation? Um, because you know, as, as a as a you know, young child myself, you know, I, how do you get into this? I wanted to be a herpetologist. I mean, if my mom's watching right now, they were looking at Cornell University's herpetology department. I don't know, um, but I, I think this is a really good, it's a really good organization that focuses on on uh, young women um, and gives them a head start in life. And I'm really proud that we'll be able to be a part of that and to have our, our female staff work with them to, to tell them how they got into this and hopefully inspire some of these uh, some of these young people because. They're the next generation. We have to inspire the younger generation because you and I are going to retire and move on, and, and we need people to take over. And I'm, I'm very proud of the uh, or the uh, partnerships we have with some of these organizations. I love it. I love that you think I can retire too. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. It's like I, you know, you always think about it, but I kind of yeah, like no, what I do. It's, you know? 
having an opportunity to spark the interest in a young person is the best. And if you're a young person who doesn't, who loves animals and doesn't know how to get involved, it, it's a very mysterious path. And so to enlighten people and inspire them and empower them and that your female staff are the ones that talks to them. I love that you're taking that kind of time. That is incredibly meaningful. And I mean, a lot of people love animals. I mean, again, yeah, you and I do this because we love animals. So how can people get started? Talk to Amy, talk to myself, talk to, to Luby, and we'll set you on the right path because I tell you what, we need these people. We need oh. them in the future now more than ever. Things are changing, some positive, some not. We need people to carry this on, like this gentleman yeah. here. <laughs> so Yeah, I love that you are doing work around the world too. Um, and these are the reports that we get at Oakland Zoo. We give a donation and we get these great reports of this juicy, amazing stuff happening in the field. Um, and this is one of them. There's a few of them. What's happening here? So uh, this is Dr. Tyrone Lavery, and he has done fantastic work out in the Solomon Islands. Love that you put that picture up. That picture uh, that's right below me is a Guadalcanal monkey-faced bat. That's the first time that bat had been seen in 25 years. And that's uh, uh, thanks to Oakland Zoo, uh, supporting Luby projects, Luby up there, and, and honestly, the great work that not only Dr. Tyrone Lavery, but Dr. Diana Fisher from the University of Queensland, Queens have done, and the local uh, biologists and researchers and rangers that are there, there as well. So the Monkey Face Project really came out, um, at least Luby's involvement, because Diana Fisher's been working there in 92, Tyrone was already working over there, University of Queensland. Um, I'm trying to make a long story short. <laughs> our founder really wanted us to work. I told you to keep sir. our founder um, was working. The, he uh, really wanted uh, Luby to work in the Pacific Island. And he put together all these biologists in 1990 to have this Pacific Island flying fox declaration. And whenever I took over as a uh, director and I, and I talked to our executive director and, and our board of trustees, it's like, how could we honor his legacy? Let's work out in the, in the Pacific. And I had always had an interest in monkey face bats. So I contacted Dr. Fisher. She told me about some of the work that she had done. She put me in touch with, I believe, a student of hers, who is Dr. Tyrone Lavery. So um, they had already had some projects going on. Luby helped to support some of those. Oakland Zoo and Oakland Zoo supporters had helped to fund some of those projects. And because of the fantastic work they're doing, uh, not only did they get pictures uh, and get great natural history data and animals that they haven't seen in years, but they're working with the local communities, they're working with the governments, because it is, as you know, nothing is going to be done unless we're working with local communities. And that's led to some forest protection. That's led to finding out um, natural history on some of these species. What can we do to protect them? What are their threats? How can we address their threats, mitigate their threats, and work with the local governments to try to come up with a, uh, an action plan? And Dr. Fisher and Dr. Lavery have done fantastic work. And seeing these pictures, that, that and some of the other ones they've sent back to me, um, it, it just kind of... I like the holistic approach and it puts it together that this is why we do what we do. We're trying to protect species. Uh, this is a good I, one. I love that all of your stories are all about local people. Um, mm -hmm. and it's great that you're such a social guy. Everyone you bring into your crew understands that, you know, communicating with local people and working as a team with them is, is really what gets us to move forward. And that's one of the reasons why we choose Luby um, as a partner. Um, they get it. You get it. Okay, what's this cute little furry face doing? This is a Roderick's fruit bat, and it looks like a cross between an Ewok and a teddy bear. And they're actually pretty common. I wouldn't say common, but you can find them in quite a few um, AZA uh, zoos and certified facilities, just like Luby. So, uh, but let's talk about Roderick's Island. Roderick's Island is um, off of the, uh, it's, it's near Madagascar. Uh, in the Mascarene Islands, the Mauritius and Reun Reunion, Sam or the Dodos were found. So Rodrigues Island uh, was basically deforested, um, 50s, 60s, 70s. And by the 70s, um, there was only about 75 of these bats left in the whole world. So Durrell Wildlife Preservation Trust brought in about a third of them, started breeding them. The good thing about flying foxes is that they breed easily, but it wasn't until the 1990s. This is one of my favorite stories. There's a woman named Mary Jane Rabuti on Rodrigues Island who started a grassroots environmental uh, movement. One person. So she started a radio show. She started talking to communities. She started talking to community elders and volunteer groups and kids. And she decided to put together this movement. It wasn't just about the bats, but they were part of it. But it was about replanting the island, bringing environmentalism into the island uh, and trying to make a difference, creating jobs. Philly Zoo got heavily involved. Luby got heavily involved. And because of this one person, there are now, there was 
On 75 of these bats left on the whole world, there are now between 16 and 20,000. There are reforestation efforts on the island. We fund every year um, an environmental uh, educator who Mary Jane is doing other things. We, we now uh, fund another uh, a woman that's there. Uh, it is a community effort. They get the community involved. They work with local, uh, they work with children, they work with volunteer groups, they work with the elderly. And I love it because one person made a difference in her country, in her island, and now they're bringing ecotourism in. The back uh, population is is doing fantastic. I mean, again, just look at just, you know, a short amount of time, what happens whenever you take a step back, let nature take over, but you have somebody who actually cares, that gets the community involved, and she's made a hell of a difference in that area. I love that. And I love that that this is what we're funding. So this is what the Oakland Zoo wants to fund, but this is, again, we can't, we weren't open for a long time, so we didn't have our funds coming in. We can't have our um, impact speaker series right now. This is what we're doing. So if you feel like this is exciting to you, um, go ahead and make a donation. Um, it really feels like this is stellar work. And and I that is an incredible success that I'd love to hear about. Okay, this looks like a whole lot of bats. That What's is, it? yep, that's a colony of um, Madagascar flying foxes. Um, and Madagascar has uh, definitely had some environmental issues with deforestation. So uh, a few years ago, um, we got a grant from Disney's Conservation Fund, and then Luby put money into it as well. And what we did is we worked with communities that were there. Um, and this is in, uh, in a region up in the Northeast. and uh, there was a colony, quite a large colony of bats there, but people were hunting them. Um, this is part of their culture, but the problem was really deforestation. So um, we funded this project. We worked with the communities, and um, what a lot of the hunters did was they created these fire breaks around a lot of these bat roosts. On the outside of those fire breaks, we funded women's groups and started a community seed project. Now, I, I should say with our partners that are there. You couldn't do this without our partners, and our partners in Madagascar, Okay, so they do great work. So we work with them. Uh, we provided funding to them, and they're the ones, you know, they initiated this project with, again, Disney and Luby funding. So the women's group started these community seed funds, and they were using sustainable agricultural techniques to plant seeds, plant farms, and all they had to do was give back what was given to them, and anything that they sold on top of that, they could brought in income. It paid for the men, because that's all their society works. It paid for the men to go out in the field, protect the bats, maintain these fire roosts and what i really really like about that about this particular project is we worked with women's groups sustainable farming uh, protecting bat roosts creating fire breaks and we worked with a lot of school kids and some of luby's projects in madagascar over the years is there's a great there's a, pro, a picture for that project right now is that we have uh, helped to fund schools over there we work with children. We work again, empowered women's groups. And again, it has to be this holistic approach to conservation. And they found that even whenever hunting was still going on, the population of uh, these roosts increased by 40%. A lot of the hunting didn't occur uh, during maternity season. Uh, they were doing it sustainably. And it was just nice to see everything come together. There are so many stories out there right now of poaching and deforestation. And everybody that's listening never... Oops, we lost Brian. Two, one, there we go. My, the point I was trying to make, <laughs> the, the point I was trying to make though is that, that there are a lot of sad stories out there, but never forget that there are great stories out there. There's great work going on. There are conservation success stories going on daily and we couldn't do it without our supporters. And that one in Madagascar, uh, Madagascar is just a fantastic project that I'm very proud of being part of. Um, that is incredible. So you've done so much. Um, I do wanna talk a little bit about what the average person like me can do outside of the job, but um, what are some of your visions and what can we all support you doing? What are some things that we can jump on and, and lend a hand or lend some support? I mean, one of the big things we're doing right now is our work out in the Solomon Islands. Um, we just got a grant there in January, and a lot of that funding going to bats and going to communities actually went towards PPE for the communities that were there, just personal protective equipment. Um, so uh, in that project, what I liked about it is it also took into account uh, sustainable farming techniques, food security, and I, I don't... I, 
I want everybody to know that a little bit goes a long way. And people yeah. ask, you know, if I donate, where could it go? $25 could put somebody out in the field in the Solomons uh, for a couple of days, just trying to find roosts of these species. And I've had so many reports with my colleagues in Australia and here in America who've worked out there that know that there are species out there that we that have, there's only been stories of. So somebody could make a donation of $25 and that could go to finding a species that, that might be completely new. It doesn't take much to do great conservation work. And Luby's been doing this for 31 years. So if people want to get involved, want to get in, in uh, uh, initiate a project with Luby and fund a project with Luby, it doesn't take much. $25, again, could fund somebody out in the field. $100 could buy binoculars and field equipment and, and help people get out there and look in these roosts, collect data. And uh, if people want to donate, you know, we're always, uh, we're always happy to accept those donations because yeah. we are a nonprofit organization and a little goes a long way. And there's a lot to be done in the world of bat conservation. Right, awesome. And I know the link to donate is somewhere in the chat, um, but go ahead and pop it up there again in case people are motivated because we only have a few more minutes here. Um, <laughs> okay. So let's also talk about what people can do. We talked about bat boxes. Um, what about palm oil? That seems to be an issue too, being palm oil aware. Check your ingredients. <laughs> I mean, it, that's the thing is, is palm oil, and there, there is sustainable palm oil um, uh, harvesting and production that goes on. So check your ingredients and go to um, the round table for sustainable palm oil mm -hmm. and check their website. And actually, uh, Luby has a link on our website as well. And I you know Oakland does. So, do your research, look at the ingredients in some of your packages and, uh, and all the boxes that you have in your house. Um, make sure that the companies that produce palm oil are doing it sustainably because it's affecting bats, it's affecting orangutans, it's affecting cats, primates, insects, you, you name it. Uh, palm oil in our lifetime is one of the biggest drivers of deforestation. And that's not to say that we're not going to continue to use palm oil. We are, it's in everything. And there's been so many studies out there. Okay, well, if we don't have palm oil, we're going to use have to use this oil, and it's going to clear so much more land because palm oil is so productive. Mm -hmm. Do your research. Use the companies that uh, are part of the roundtable for sustainable palm oil that use it and harvest it sustainably. I love it. Um, and I also love that you have um, plant night blooming gardens. <laughs> that is correct. That sounds wonderful. And I know there's... Yeah. Okay. I like... Yeah, the People want to bring bats into their yard. There's a lot of uh, night blooming jasmine. There's a lot of night blooming flowers that are going to attract insects, going to attract moths. And people can go ahead and, and they put those uh, types of plants on their garden. That's going to attract bats as well. So there's a lot that people could do putting up a bat house, night blooming garden. You could leave dead trees in your yard as long as it's not a safety hazard because a lot of bats roost in those tree hollows along with a lot of other species. I love it. So Adrian put in the um, link um, in the links an app you can use about palm oil. And um, also I love your website is really helpful. It even says what to do if you find a bat because um, people just don't know what to do. So what do you do? Um, <laughs> loaded question. The best thing to do is a lot of times we get we get questions if people find a bat and they think it's a baby. And honestly, a lot of our species are just what? small. Uh, yeah, if you find a bat in the ground, it's, it, it seems sick. Call your local wildlife uh, rehabilitator. That, that's one of the best things to do. Never, ever uh, bare hand a bat or any other wildlife. There are species, a species here in Florida called a tricolored bat. And sometimes they just like to hang on the side of a building in, in broad daylight. They like to be under umbrellas. So, I mean, it's, you know, there's a lot of different options. But honestly, the best thing to do is just leave it alone. If you're really concerned about it, call uh, your local uh, wildlife uh, rehabilitator rescue center, and they'll be able to take it from there. Okay. Appreciate that. Um, someone did ask, is there a connection with Bacardi and Luby? And I know that there is because there was a founder through Bacardi, but I want to emphasize that it's not like you're being supported through that. So yeah. just a nonprofit, um, just like any, any other nonprofit who really needs support elsewhere like this community. Yeah, I mean, real quick, we were founded by one of the Bacardis, but he had nothing to do with the company. We are not funded uh, by Bacardi Corporation. Um, and uh, we're a completely separate entity. We're a nonprofit that uh, struggles for funding, just like any other one. So, you know, we're always looking for support, donors and members. So uh, please visit our website. I know you guys have links, links, and we really appreciate that. And please support Luby and the work we do. 
All right. Um, Brian, any parting words you want to leave us with? And I want to let everyone know if there's questions that got unanswered, um, Brian, in the next few days, will make his way through the questions and answer them on Facebook. So you will be able to find those. I wanted to thank you. I want to thank Oakland Zoo for having us for Cocktails and Conservation. Um, I wanted to thank you guys and all of the Oakland Zoo supporters who in turn helped to support a lot of uh, Luby's projects. And for the folks out there, just know that there are so many myths uh, surrounding bats. Um, and uh, they are these very gentle, um, very mysterious animals um, who just appreciate the, the love and respect as all the other animals out there. So uh, there's uh, it's a little tough time right now in bat conservation. There's a lot of blame going around, but they're amazing animals. Um, and uh, we've been doing this for 31 years that so we're just trying to uh, learn as much as we can about them uh, through research concert, conservation education. And we hope everybody will uh, check out our website, luby.org, uh, learn more about bats, learn more about the work that we do, and just appreciate bats and the other wildlife that's around you. And again, thank you guys very much. Well, toast to you, Brian, and all you do, and your family, um, your dog, your cat, your wife, and all those wonderful bats. Give my love to Arthur. He's my guy. And, um, and, and we, really, we really appreciate it. We just appreciate you and all you do. And have a, have a lovely evening. And for those interested, we do have another one of these in a couple of weeks. August 12th is California Condors with the Wildlife Society. Cool. Brian, thank you so much. And everyone have a great night. Cheers. 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 Thank you for having me, Amy.